Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Donna Chow, and I am your host and your moderator for today's eLotus webinar. Here at eLotus, we have been hosting educational courses for over two decades, and we are proud to be your trusted source for premium CU content with over 200 speakers, 700 courses, and 3,000 hours of continued education. Today's webinar is Unveiling the Mystery of Alchemical Chinese Medicine, presented by Lita Herman. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few items to familiarize you with our webinars and how they work. So today's webinar will be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And we will have four breaks, two breaks in the morning and two in the afternoon. And Lita will let you know when those are. For lecture notes, download them directly from the Blue Course Access page in your eLotus account. To use the webinar chat room, set your chat preference to everyone so that everyone can see what you're typing and be part of the conversation. To ask the speaker a question, enter your question into the Q&A box. If time allows, lead over and respond to them. And finally, the quiz and the video replay. You'll be notified by email tomorrow afternoon once they are available. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Lita Herman, who has spent over 20 years immersed in the philosophies of Taoism, alchemical healing, and Chinese medicine. She is a Chinese medicine teacher and alchemical healer. She's also the founder of Alchemy Healing Center, a thriving Chinese medicine clinic in Northampton, Massachusetts, dedicated to assisting clients in discovering their true potential through alchemical transformation. Okay, Lita, you can go ahead and share your screen and your PowerPoint now. Lita, I think your mic is mute. Hello, Lita? Yes, okay. thank you. <laughs> yeah, <mic> back <laughs> All right. Let me just uh, go back here. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here today for this uh, class, Unveiling the Mystery of Alchemical Chinese Medicine. Um, I, I just wanted to say before we start that I had a lot of fun putting this class together for you all. And if you came to the webinar on Thursday, you got a little taste of it. And basically everything today is is very in-depth and much more content than, than what we did on Thursday. So I, I hope you'll enjoy taking a deeper dive today. And just to go over the agenda for today, we have um, an introduction and a history of alchemy. And we're going to talk about the role of the alchemical practitioner. We're going to go into much more detail than we did again on the webinar. For those of you who joined us, you do, you do not have to have seen the webinar to, to join us today. There'll be um, some overlap, but mostly it'll be much more in depth. Then we're going to go into what are the specific alchemical treatment protocols and some of the diagnostic techniques to understand which of the protocols are uh, important to be using. We're going to specifically talk about the 13 ghost points and the nine heart pains treatments, as well as the nine stages of alchemy. And interspersed today through all of that, are going to be little alchemical meditations that we're going to be doing. These are meditations that are for you as the practitioner to understand yourself and to understand you as a practitioner. But there are also meditations that you might share with a client who, for example, is going through the nine stages of alchemy or going through the ghost points. So they kind of are dual in their role. And I hope that, you know, you'll enjoy it for that reason. And then in the end, I'm going to save time for Q and a, but I will, um, I would appreciate it as you go along to go ahead and put your questions in the chat box and, um, and I, that way I will uh, save enough time at the end to answer your questions. So go ahead and, you know, use the Q and a, uh, chat box as we go along. And then on my break, I'll check it. And, you know, if it's appropriate to answer it during the next segment, then I'll go ahead and do that. Otherwise we'll do it at the end. Okay. So here we go. Um, so first of all, how did I become interested in alchemy? And I think it's important for you to understand where I'm coming from. I've always been interested in the psycho-emotional spiritual aspects of healing, because when I first started out, I was really trying to heal myself. And I discovered plant spirit medicine with Elliot Cohen, which was a shamanic healing. 
And I was a very, you know, very fast paced life. I um, was working for a tech company. I was, you know, a young, very successful um, tech person and I was getting sick and I was getting sicker and sicker. And so what brought me to Chinese medicine initially, actually, before I even uh, started studying was that illness and which was endometriosis and um, nothing was helping me. Western medicine wasn't helping me. Eastern medicine did help me. And then finally I got interested in doing it. Once I took that class, I was hooked. I really decided that this was kind of the career I was looking for, which took me some time to transition. I studied very intensively in the Worsley based five element tradition after that. And so that led, that led sort of unbeknownst to me to a whole different direction, which was alchemy, because the person I was studying with Nikki Bilton was very interested in possession and the ghost points, and which then led me to master Jeffrey Yuen, who at the time back in 2004, when I met him was teaching the ghost points at NISA in Boston. And so, you know, it's, it's been a tw over 20 year journey. It's been an unusual journey. Um, but I've been really uh, ever since that first, you know, time when I was really seeking my own health um, healing, uh, it's been a, this evolution and it really has gone towards alchemy. So again, you know, when I met Jeffrey Yuan, that really just shifted everything. Once I discovered what alchemy was, I, I started studying with him in his advanced acupuncture program and traveled all over the world with him. And we even got to go to China three times. It was, it was really amazing um, to do that work with him. So my approach to teaching, I know that a lot of us are taking a lot of, you know, wonderful classes. A lot have to do with theory and some with practice. I think that my gift um, to you know, my students is that I have a very good way of communicating something that's theoretical and putting it into practical perspective. So I hope that you'll find that today. Uh, I really don't think this is just a lecture. I think of it more as something that you're going to really experience for yourself. And that's a lot of what the alchemical work that I'm teaching is about. It's about us as practitioners evolving, not just helping our patients. So it's really, how do we apply these theories to a modern day practice? So just in case you don't know much about me, we have a healing center in Northampton, Massachusetts called the Alchemy Healing Center. We also have an online portion, which is the Alchemy Learning Center, where you can actually take some of our previous online courses like the Ghost Points and, and several others like that. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Oops. Um, Sorry. And then also we have a podcast. It's called the Inspired Action Podcast. We've been doing this since 2018. And basically it covers all of the alchemical information, both for your clients, but also for yourself. So, you know, check it out. It's fun. It's supposed to be light and entertaining and people seem to really enjoy it. And we recently just released a new al alchemy book, called Through the Mystery Gate, A Taoist Alchemy Self-Discovery Journey, which if you like this class, I highly recommend you get it because it goes through every stage in detail and with uh, many meditations and techniques that you can you know, share with your clients if you're doing this work. Um, we also wrote some five element books and a gua sha book. Um, and so again, uh, for those, you know, I apologize for those who came to the webinar, but we're going to slow it down and just go through some of the stuff that we've covered already much uh, more in detail. So what is alchemy? Alchemy is this concept that we are already perfect. We're like gold, but we think that we're one of the base metals that corrodes and breaks down over time. So we don't believe that we're perfect. So it, it's really about how do we discover that perfection of ourselves, of our spirit? So the idea is the Shen, the spirit can never break down or corrode. When you bury gold in the ground, it could be there for a thousand years. And when you dig it up, it's the same wonderful, beautiful gold that you, that you buried initially. So that's the idea of us as a human spirit. We're never going to break down. We never can be harmed in any way, even though we feel like we're going to become decrepit and old and die. So alchemy is about a transformational process and it's about exploring the mystery, the Tao. It's also as a practitioner exploring multiple dimensions, alternate realities, you know, that shamanic realm, 
you know, all the things that are and are not. And when I say are not, I'm talking about the void between heaven and earth. So what is between heaven and earth? Chi. And so everything that's kind of this movement of, of the universe is between those two places, meaning that um, chi, there's a, a place that we can get to more from our mental state or from our hearts that we call the void. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. So don't, don't freak out if you have no idea what I'm talking about. So um, as I mentioned on, uh, in the webinar, you know, Western alchemy also believes that we can turn base metal into gold. So there's that tie in and they were looking for the philosopher's stone or the sorcerer's stone for immortality, which by the way, for your stone medicine people, new might is believed to be that stone that can unlock that inherent magic in a person. And what they were really looking for was immortality. So there's a lot of commonality between the Western version and the Eastern version of alchemy. And I think that that the, the place where they meet is this idea of, of something that is incorruptible. It's like gold. So what is an alchemical mindset? It's this idea that your spirit can never be harmed or disintegrate. It's this idea that maybe we could even become physically immortal. So if you're going to embrace that idea, you have to embrace it as if you're immortal now. It's a mindset. It's not a future state. Oh, I want to live to be, you know, 200 years old or 600 years old. It's more that I am currently immortal. So it's the idea that you're not just waiting for your expiration date. You're not just, death is not this impending doom that's just coming. And, and also this idea that we're going to decay, it has to kind of leave your mindset. And also finally, not afraid of death and dying. That's a big one. And for practitioners doing alchemy work, especially with the ghost points, you really have to look at your fear of death or dying. If you do indeed have fear of death or dying, because you really can't be working, for example, with Gwei, if you are afraid of dying, you know, essentially the Gwei are already dead, if you want to think of it that way. And so they need to know that you're not afraid of that state. So these are big, big concepts. These are not just light things. And they, and that's why as a practitioner, this is about a transformation of you as you go into this kind of work. I like to say that if you think about yourself as a little boat on the sea, in terms of our normal lives, we're just being tossed this way and that way. And, you know, one minute things are good and the next minute they're bad and we don't seem to have control over them. Or worse, some of our clients and even potentially some of us feel like everything's bad. Everything is all bad. And if that's the case, then there's definitely alchemical treatments that help with that, like the ghost points. So like, if you think about alchemy as adding a rudder, a sail, a captain's wheel to your little boat, it means that you're becoming a wizard, a master of your own life. And then things are all good. So even when it looks bad, you can see that it's going to maybe potentially become good again because everything is yin and yang and in flux. And so there's really never any good or bad. So we like to say it's about being not, a, being not moral or immoral, but amoral, meaning there is no good or bad. So this is also a quest in the past to become immortal. Um, and in terms of whether you're going to be on that quest, that's up to you. And alchemy is really for anyone who wants to go through a deep transformation. And also, it's not just about being happy. We, we often say, you know, humans, we say, I just want to be happy. But often we're referring to happy in relation to something outside of ourselves. We want happy circumstances is what we really mean. And instead, uh, alchemy is about that inner happiness that inner alchemy. So we're going to talk a lot about that. So what brings that inner happiness is this feeling of freedom and your authentic self. So I often say that anyone who's interested in alchemy, if they can say, there's got to be more to life than this, you know, whatever this is, it's their lives. And they feel like there's something more, there's something more. It's more than just like getting up, going to work, you know, coming home, eating dinner, going to sleep, you know, rinse and repeat. It's, it's, there's more to it. 
And for those of us who are truly suffering, it's also about ending that suffering. So what is going to do that? Letting go of the past so that we can start to feel free. And when I say free, I mean free to be you and me, <laughs> which is a uh, reference for people who are old enough to, who remember that. Free to be you and me is, is this idea that you can live authentically and not be beholden to society's sort of ways of dictating your life, which even, you know, as a practitioner, that may come up because you feel maybe restricted in your life by being that uh, upstanding person in the community. And, you know, I'm just giving an example. Is that really authentically who you are? And how do you still maintain your authenticity in that state? So the benefits of doing alchemy, first and foremost, is releasing the baggage of this lifetime and also your past lives. But what we want is a lightness. We don't want you to feel weighed down by those memories of the past. And then, then you can start to become your authentic self. Alchemy is also about releasing your habits of perception. We only see things the way they are. And we have difficulty seeing things as where, how they're really happen, happening. And children often don't have these blinders. They just see what's happening and they don't have a lot of judgment about what's happening. They're just experiencing it. So aging by its very definition is habits of perception. As we start to age, we get more and more rigid about what we're going to um, do, what we're going to experience, what we don't want to experience, what we don't want to do. And so these habits of being are what's actually aging us. So you can see that if, if we want to be immortal, we want to kind of at least retard aging or make it go slower. And so we have to open up our perception. And it's also about being limitless in your re interactions with the world, because as you open up your perception, you start to develop spontaneity again. We don't have a lot of spontaneity in our, in our society these days. We have to-do lists and we have calendars and timesheets. And you know this is, this is really hampering us from living a wu-wei life. So Wu Wei is that term that I like to translate as inspired action, which is why we call the podcast that some people call it non-action, which I think is a little misleading. It's about being inspired to take the next footstep forward in your life. And so that's the limitlessness, the spontaneity that we're talking about. And when you're spontaneous like that, then that's the metaphor for me of when you're truly flying in your life or I often say when you're living your full potential, because as you kind of let go of that baggage, you open up your perception, you stop living habitually, you start living with this, anything is possible, look at life, then that's what I call flying in your life. Now the ancient immortals were purported to actually fly and actually defy gravity. And I always joke that, you know, someday I'm going to see someone levitate off my, my table. I haven't seen it yet, but I fully am open to expecting that that could possibly happen. So any possibility, um, but anyway, we're going to talk more about that today. So I just wanted to kind of talk to you about the work you're currently doing versus what that would look like as alchemy. Because if most of us are doing maybe primary channel treatments or maybe some eight extraordinary, or if you've studied with Jeffrey UN, maybe some divergence, some Luo channels, you know, whatever your thing is, um, what you're doing now, how is that different from alchemy? So the main difference is think of the work you're doing with clients now as slow transformation. You know, they're ill, you're trying to move them back to health, for example. So that's might, might take several months. You know, you're, you know, if you're lucky, maybe a couple of days, you know, for like an elbow pain or something, but you know, often we're working with people where there's a very slow transformation going on. Alchemy is about transmutation. It's a much more um, you know, going in with big guns, like, you know, we're going to make a big change here. I should probably reference guns today with the war going on, but anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's really much different than transformation. Transmutation is something radically shifting radical change. So you could say that the divergence and the eight extraordinary vessels also make that level of change. 
However, they're very slow and they work slowly and they're working with Jing directly and they're, you know, getting in to really shift Jing, you know, where, you know, maybe you can even um, shift things that are hereditary, which seems almost, you know, miraculous from a Western point of view, but we know that the work that is done in Chinese medicine can work at that deep level. But again, alchemy is much faster than that. It's really more focused on the Shen than the Jing or both at least. And so there's more substantial change that's faster. So the ghost points treatment, for example, the way I typically do it is I do the whole set in one day and there's an immediate shift and the person knows it and I know it. And then that change takes three to six months to fully unfold. And what I like to say is the change happened that day, but the habits of perception and the habits of living resist the change. And it takes at least three months for the person's habits to start to fall away. The best example I have of this is a woman who I didn't even know smoked. She didn't want to admit it to me. We did this treatment about a month and a half afterwards, she came in and she said, Lita, I, I don't understand it. I stopped smoking. I was like, oh, you smoked? She goes, yes, I, I did. I didn't want to tell you. I was embarrassed, but I suddenly stopped smoking and I don't know why. And the reason was that she no longer had a reason to smoke. She, she, she wanted to all her life stop smoking. She was already in her 50s but she just couldn't do it because there was something in her that was hooked into her that she couldn't really let herself stop smoking, even though I think she'd done it a couple of times briefly, and then she kept coming back to it. So this time she, it lasted, she was able to heal the thing that made her need to smoke. And it was all unconscious. It was all much deeper. I call it cellular patterns. It was something that was under the level of her consciousness. So not, it wasn't something she was trying to do. She just stopped picking up the cigarettes. So imagine a client coming to you for the first time and you can sense their true nature and essence when they walk in the door, but something's clouding that something is deep or buried. You sense it in yourself. And these are some of the techniques from I'm trying to help you develop if you don't feel like you have them already. And that's fine if you don't but you're starting to sort of look at people a little differently. These things are sometimes hard to access for them, but it's like, you can feel it. It's if you see auras, you might see the aura look gray. For example, I see very monochromatically myself. I'm not one of the people gifted with a lot of aura uh, abilities, um, but I often see a gray, funny look like a cloud around the person or you might hear it in their voice. The voice doesn't sound authentic. That voice doesn't match the person. And often after you do a big treatment, like I was talking about just before, their voice changes in some cases, like radically, like a very high, high voice suddenly gets kind of a lower tone and they notice it there. Their partners notice it, their children notice it. Everyone's like, what happened to you? You know, because that other voice was not their true essence. So alchemy is freeing people from whatever this thing is, this thing that you know is not the true nature of the person. So the path of alchemy for you as a practitioner is to, you know, set this intention, to live with this intention to have self-discovery and also self-cultivation. And most of us are really focused on survival and it really is stepping out of that sort of way of living. So again, the fear is a big thing we need to address. And a lot of today, late today, we're gonna to be talking about fear. When we do the enter the mystery gate meditation, we're gonna be talking about our fears. So we have to address that. And also this idea that we're trying to be happy, 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 all being based on the external world. Again, the self-cultivation is the happiness on the inside. And I, I recognize that many of you have a meditation practice already and you're doing your thing. So this will just be reinforcing the work you're already doing. And if you're not, then this is maybe an invitation for you to, to try some of these alchemical meditations for yourself. All right. So questions to ask yourself as we begin. 
why would I want to die at an appropriate age? Or why might I want to have be become reborn if I die? Or maybe why would I want to live an extra long life? Like if I told you today, you could live to be 200 years. In fact, if I told you today that you emphatically are going to live to be 200 years, how would you have to rethink your life? Like right now you're planning for retirement. Maybe you're, you know, you, you, where am I going to live in my eighties or whatever, however old you think you'll be when you want to figure that all out. So that's a really big shift in your life to think, However old you are, you're only halfway through your life or maybe a quarter of your way through your life or three quarters, you know, it's like where, wherever you are, it, if we just added a lot of years to the end of what you think your life is, that's going to re- shift the whole way you think about living. So it's, it's again, do you want to live to that old age where you now have really figured things out? You know, you've lived this long, you get to live another hundred years and really figure it out. Your wisdom palace, the nine palaces palace called wisdom is just going to be rocking it. You're, you're going to be on this planet for so long. You figured everything out. Why would you want to do that? Do you want to do that? Do you want immortality? What would it be like if you were on this planet longer than maybe a lot of the people, you know, and so you know, then the question comes, all right, if we just stop thinking about death, what do we want our time in this lifetime to be like? What kind of quality of life are we looking for? So these are all the questions that alchemy forces us to ask ourselves. Now, I always say that alchemy is a little bit lonely because there's, you know, normal life you know, where you're just trying to get, be happy and survive. And then there's this alchemical life, which is really kind of different. And so if you embark on this and you probably feel this way already being a Chinese medicine practitioner, because I think we all kind of have been, been receiving some of this information through our learning. It's all infused in all of Chinese medicine. You really can't separate alchemy out from Chinese medicine. And so some of us have already kind of felt that little bit of loneliness, but we have each other. And one of the things, one of the reasons why Jay and I, Jay McElroy and I, who wrote the book together and created the Alchemy Healing Center together, why we created the Alchemy Learning Center is we were like, let's get alchemists together. And at least we won't be alone. We'll have a community. So again, it can, it is always ultimately though your path. And it is the path of one. It can never be something that's completely shared, even though you may have lovely friends who kind of think like you do. Really, it's unique to you, meaning that you may need to take a different direction than others. The path is just uniquely yours. So if you're really uh, thinking about like this alchemical work, you have to think of it as stepping out of normal life. You really aren't kind of going to be that normal person just trying to survive and be happy. And that means that you need to become a watcher in your life. Uh, If you're not familiar with Eckhart Tolle, I really love his description of how to be a watcher of yourself. Because the first thing you have to do is discover yourself, become aware of yourself, which means now you need to watch yourself. So a lot of alchemy is about teaching our, our clients how to watch themselves, how to engage themselves at a completely different level. So this is a linear process, but any stage can be repeated. So I like to say that there's a a bunch of really smart, ancient people, men and women who put together this idea of this process that we're gonna teach today, but it's not the only way. And we know there's traditions all over the world, yogic traditions, all kinds of traditions that have similar alchemical concepts in them. And so we can't say that this is the only way or even the right way, but it is a way that, that has already been laid out. So I say it's a map and it's your map. It's got signposts along the way. And if you choose to follow it, great. And even if you're following it linearly, you may have to circle back and start over. You may have to repeat different stages. It doesn't work linearly in the sense of you can never kind of revisit things. I often go back myself and revisit stage one of alchemy 
whenever my life starts to feel difficult. Because guess what? We're human and humans feel like they have obstacles and we need to overcome those obstacles. And stage one, as you'll see it by the end, is all about that. So I say that every human that's walking through this, there's no time-based schedule. There's only your schedule. We can't force you to move faster than you're going or slower than you're going. It's your pace. And it's not a race. Even if you're you're a fast, you know, rabbit, you know, you can be a turtle, you can be a tortoise. It's it's your pace. So, and it's supposed to be enjoyable. <laughs> so there you go. All right. So in addition to just alchemy in general, we can also really look at the five elements. And I know that some of you have not studied the five elements a lot. So when I'm working with my apprentices, I'm having to really teach a lot of five element at a very deep level. And even the five element practitioners that are studying with me are not really immersed in that level of it, because to do this work, you have to really take all that knowledge of the five elements and really understand it deeply inside yourself. So the first step is self-discovery, self-awareness. Also, that brings in the nine palaces. We're going to talk about that today because you have a curriculum of your, this lifetime. If you think in the Taoist way of looking at it, you have this curriculum and part of it is finding balance between all the things that are important to you. And that's, as we know, really hard and really tricky. So in addition, we have to start to self-cultivate. It's, it's understanding ourselves, but now it's taking it further. It's like, how am I going to grow myself? I'm the garden. I'm going to cultivate this beautiful garden. I mean, even if you love being a wild untamed garden in alchemy, then you're still cultivating that that's okay. You can be wild and untamed, but it's going to be a, a, a cultivated version of that. So this self-cultivation process, it's a sacred and precious gift to you. It's yours. So find your path. You know, that's what we're going to say. Self-cultivation doesn't have to be what someone else is self-cultivating. If I tell you to do a meditation and you hate it, why would you do it? It's not enjoyable. You're going to find the things you love to do. So there's no one way to do alchemy. So the other thing to think about is, is like, once you understand your five elements and you understand the balance in your life through the nine palaces and you start self-cultivating, alchemy is like this fairy dice, dust that you just sprinkle over it and the magic starts to happen. And that's what alchemy really is. It's, it's outside of the five elements. You no longer need to be restricted by your energetic nature. If you're fire and you're always chatty and talking to people and you love life and you're, you know, like that, then what if, what if you really just want to transform into someone who's meditating and enjoying that? And you just need to bring yourself inward. That's not energetically who you are. And you have the choice to do that because of alchemy. So alchemy is really blowing out of our energetic natures. It's, it's going beyond our energetic natures, but you can't do that until you first accept the way you have been born and who you truly are. And then you can grow from that. And so if you're doing that, then you can begin to have that chance to truly fly in your life. So first you kind of find your authentic self and then that authentic self can transform and transmutate and it can become something else. So again, we're going to address today the five elements in the nine palaces. You really can't ignore this. If this is a weak area for you, we have a five element class and a nine palaces class in the Alchemy Learning Center where we really put everything we could think of into them. So if it's a weak area, don't worry about it. It's time to kind of really look at this again. Um, and, and if it's not in your practice, that's not, that's not what this is about. It's not like becoming a five element acupuncturist. That's, it, you know, that's a whole separate thing. This is more about understanding your elements and being able to understand the client's elements so that you can help them as you're doing alchemy with them to have that same deep understanding of themselves that you have of yourself, hopefully after you start to really engage this. I also want to make sure that, you know, today isn't really as much about the protocols as about the information that sort of um, 
it's, it's helping you understand the concepts behind them because technically, again, this is just one group of people's you know, roadmap. It's not the only way. And if you understand the concepts, you can invent your own alchemy. You don't have to follow the eight immortals version, for example, or go hung's version. You can create your own once you understand the concepts and you might have to, because if you don't love what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it. You should find something else. So that's the idea. So the question right now today is, are you ready for alchemy? And to embark on alchemy, there has to be a sincere willingness to change your life. If you've finally gotten to a place where you're like, oh, man, I, this is it. I don't want anything to change. I just need to coast here for as long as possible. Life was really hard and I finally got it all together. I don't want any, I don't want to rock the boat. That's not really a place where you're going to do alchemy from that. That is a wonderful thing. And you should you should do that. Like there's no reason you have to do alchemy. Sometimes when you feel like that, you don't want to open the Pandora's box of stuff that you kind of stuffed away. You're just finally happy. And that's good enough. Like let that be, if that feels good. So that's, and think about your clients client comes in, you think, Oh, I should do alchemy with them. This is going to be really fun. And they're like, no, I want to just be here. I don't want to go there. I don't want to transform. So you really need to look at that. So the other thing is if someone's not sincerely willing to change, but they're, they're coming, you feel like they need alchemy. You feel like there's something there. Then the ghost points can help them get to a place of having the willingness to change because the ghosts are hooked into us and make us very rigid again and not wanting change. So that's another way to look at it. The other thing is to be centered enough in yourself. If you're freaking out all over the place or your client is just freaking out all over the place, you know, again, that might not be the best time to start alchemy. There are even clients who can't do the ghost points. It's just too much. And all you can do is just sort of try to stabilize, stabilize, stabilize. So you can ask that question is this person? so much out on the periphery that they can't center in themselves at all. And it might just not be the right time for alchemy. And the, the thing is, you know, no matter who I'm working with, their lives radically change. And there's no, in some cases, no reason for the change. Like there, there isn't like some horrible thing happening that they're trying to get rid of, but they still go through the transformation. So again, being willing to allow that radical transformation is important. Um, and, and to feel grounded enough in your life that that's not going to totally freak you out. And it's okay if it freaks you out a little bit. I think pretty, pretty much everyone feels a little freaked out about change, but again, a lot of this is really good change. And so, you know, most people can, can walk through it pretty easily. So in order to go into self-discovery, the first thing you have to think about is your self-judgment. Are you willing to forgive and forget? especially yourself and the things you've done or others and the things they've done. And if not, then that's that Pandora's box idea. You know, if you're working with a client and, and you open that Pandora's box, it can be way too much for them. So it's really up to you to sort of gauge, you know, what this is about. And one of the reasons I like to do the 13 ghost points, for example, in a long session, we're going to talk a lot about this today. Why do I do a long session? Is that if that person's Pandora's box gets opened, I have the rest of the day to work it through with them. And through the points themselves, a lot of the Pandora's box issues gets resolved by the end of the day. So that's one of the concepts that we're going to be talking about today for people who have a lot of baggage. So again, we're, we're looking at the self-discovery process as sincerely wanting to engage the deepest part of yourself. And we're looking, you're looking for more of yourself. You're trying to find things that you haven't ever thought about before. You haven't experienced before. So again, a sincere heart to be willing to engage this process is necessary. And again, it's not for everyone. You know, if it's too frightening, don't have to do it. You know, maybe you don't want to do it because you think your friends and family aren't going to understand and they're going to disapprove. And especially if maybe you're an earth element, for example, 
family's everything. Family's so important. So why would you do something that would be so upsetting to your friends and family? So you have to look at that. You have to ask yourself these questions and you may be unwilling to focus on yourself um, because of that family. You know, maybe you think you need to really focus on family and take care of people. And a lot of times I have to say that doing alchemy with parents of little children is very difficult. They have to be super earnest in their desire to do it because guess what, you know, meditate or change the baby's diaper. You're going to pick the baby's diaper every time, you know, hopefully you are. And so, you know, um, that, that process of self-discovery and self-transformation is going to be more difficult because you have these, um, expectations that are on you that you really want to fulfill. And so you can't really focus on yourself. So, and the question is, do you have the desire? Do you actually want to do this kind of work? And if you have the desire, then do you have the will to do it? Because it's going to take some effort. And so these are questions that we're going to ask by the end of the day, we're going to be doing some meditations about this. So when faced with transformation, do you resist it? And do you need the will to feel motivated to do it? These are all issues about our will. You know, we're going to talk today about our will a little bit. And, and what are the stories that you're telling yourself about your current life? You may have a lot of stories like a financial woe or a relationship issue or a career issue. You know, maybe you don't like your current career that much. And that's why you're here because you think, oh, maybe alchemy will feel better. But, you know, these are the stories that you need to address as you look at your nine palaces because your nine palaces are the stories. They're the stories of your life that, you know, maybe you, you've been telling for a very long time. Okay. So, um, all right. Oops. I went, hold on a second. All right. So if you're not ready, no worries. Um, don't be discouraged today. You can still get a lot out of this class because there's a lot in here that's really for all of us. It doesn't mean that we have to be alchemists. So the ghost points are um, something that can help people get ready. So if you don't feel ready, don't worry, because the ghost points are really about that. The nine heart pains treatment also can help people get ready. So if you have clients that you're like, I, I really think they're here to do alchemy, but they're not ready, then you would, would look at doing those treatments. So you're exploring your own self-awareness, your own self-cultivation. You're looking at what kinds of self-cultivation you might like. And again, it's up to you. You might like meditations. You might like Tai Chi. You might like Qigong. You might even like Kung Fu. You might want to just walk in nature. You know, these are all things that are about your choices in how to do this. All right. So that's um, our first segment. We're going to go into the history of alchemy now. And specifically, I'm sure there were other alchemists before Gohung, but Gohung is the main one that, um, that I talk about a lot. And he basically, um, we got to go to his mountain, Jay and I, to Luofushan in China. And this is a cauldron. So we're going to talk about the alchemical cauldron today, later on. And so that's what it looks like. Now, Gohung lived um, in, in the common era, 283 to 343, and he was responsible for creating the whole, a lot of the concepts of what we're going to talk about today really came from Gohung initially, and he did what was called stone elixirs. He was using stone medicine, and he wrote a book called Bao Puzza, and it's about simplicity. And he was really promoting this idea of be, living simply, embracing simplicity, now he created those initial nine elixirs, which now has translated to these nine stages of alchemy that we're going to talk to about, but he was including poisonous substances like mercury and cinnabar and realgar and opramin. These stones were highly toxic and they, and they were ingesting them and they were surviving ingesting them. So I always joke, well, then maybe you're immortal if you can drink that and still live. Um, but I don't think that's what they were thinking about. They were actually trying to transform their Jing and they were using these highly toxic substances to do that. We always mentioned Bao Gu, who this is her 
herb washing pool on the Wofushan. And because Baogu was really into the herbal components of what they were doing, um, I, I like to think that she was the inspiration for the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize that was won in China by a, a woman. I'm sorry, I don't, don't remember her name, but she developed something for an Artemisia a uh, recipe that was hanging on the placards that circled this pool at the um, mountain. So she clearly got that recipe from, hopefully we could say it was from Baogu, although Gohong is credited with everything on the mountain. But anyway, this was her washing pool though. So this is this was her place. And this is um, Baogu and Gohong. And um, so let's so let's just move on to Sun Si Miao because uh, there's quite a gap there, a couple hundred years, but Sun Si Miao is, is often known as the king of medicine. And uh, he invented the 13 ghost point protocol. So this is kind of really important to, to think of him. And out of, he didn't invent the points because they were invented much earlier in 400 BCE. And there were 20 points. So he picked out of the 20, 13 points and put them into a ghost point protocol. He also did not like Gohung's approach of stone elixirs. He thought, this is crazy. Why are we drinking these poisonous substances? Why don't we just do this internally through meditation and through acupuncture? And so he started developing this idea that we could do this energetically instead of drinking physical elixirs. He was just very famous in medicine. He wrote some amazing books. He, you know, mastered all the classics by age 20. He was truly transformational. These are some pictures from his house in China. And um, yeah, and so obviously a lot of sort of these ideas of doorways um, are all throughout the house. And then we move on to the eight immortals. So this is a group of eight beings that were, again, quite a bit later than Sun Si Miao. And here they all are. And what's unique about them is that they represent all the different kinds of people in the world. So there's elderly, there's young people, there's beautiful people and ugly people. There's, there's female, male, and even transgender. And so there are these, all these different types of people and are wealthy and poor. Um, so they represent humanity. And so the idea is anyone can be an alchemist. Anyone can become immortal. Some of the famous ones was one of Lao Tzu's students. Um, there was one who really worked with the Tibetans. Ludon Bin is kind of the most famous one. He's, he's famous for his millet dream where he, he dreamt his whole life and then realized it was pointless and decided to become immortal instead. Um, and there was again, the one, one that was female. So, you know, there's just a lot of notable things. And again, they represent all types of people. So it's just proof that everyone has the potential to be immortal. So here's Lu Dong Bin. Um, so he was, no one knows if he's, you know, this is just legend, but he, he seems to have lived a very long time and um, he had his millet dream. And he also did the, a famous thing that you can look up if you don't know it, the 10 trials of Lu Dong Bin, which I think is a really interesting, um, interesting set of concepts um, that, that come in, in a lot in, in the teaching that we're doing, not so much today, but just, just his homework for you. And then Ma Dan Yang, I don't, I don't know his death date. I couldn't figure that out, but much later now we're talking a little bit later, but he and his wife were supposed to be students of one of these eight immortals. So, um, so, you know, the timelines don't always work out or they really are immortal and they've been living these very long lives. And so Wang Chong Yang was a student of Ludan Bin and he had seven students who became the seven masters of the Chen Zhen school or the complete reality school. And so, you know, probably Ma Dan Yang from the 12 starry sky points, which we're going to talk about that just a little today. And his wife is very notable. Sun Boer actually was more important than him in a lot of ways. And she established a school called the purity and tranquility school of Taoism. And she was a poet and an advocate for women. And she, you know, one of her most famous stories was she radically transformed her face in order to travel around China by herself. She poured hot oil on her face 
And that's how tough this woman was. Cause she was like, I'm not going to let men, she was very beautiful. And she's like, I'm not going to let, you know, let myself be maybe, you know, accosted or raped or something like that as I travel through the country. So that's why she made herself ugly, so to speak. All right. So that's a brief history of all of it. Obviously there's, there's much more to it, but I wanted to just kind of bring you the notable things that, that you might um, find. And now we're going to talk about more about the role of the alchemical practitioner. This is uh, the doorway that I have been so enamored with um, since I've been to Sun Tzu Miao's house in 2010. This is um, the yin yang symbol on this door, as you may notice, is on its side, which is the symbol for alchemy. So we often see it up and down. So what is alchemical healing? Um, again, you're focused on the person's perfection. So imagine you're, you're doing your, you're in your clinic. Someone walks through the door. They're obviously a mess. They're obviously in a lot of pain. How do you not focus on their problems? How do you not hear that story and buy into it and start to think, oh, they're really messed up. I got a, I got a lot of work to do here. What if you see the perfection of them as, as already there, that's alchemical healing. So we're getting to the source of the issues. Why are they there? What is deeper than the illness? And how can we bring that forth again in the person? So we're really looking for the person's authenticity, their authentic identity and their destiny. And it's shui chi or evil chi or perverted chi, however you want to think of it, that maybe has, has taken them off course has detoured them in their life. Maybe it's trauma, maybe it's, you know, abuse from a, a parent or a spouse, whatever has really caused them their destiny to be subverted. So it's not that we're not seeing those problems, those things, but we're, we're really seeing something underneath that something that's pure, something that's truly them. And so alchemical healing is facilitation. It's not helping. We, we often think of ourselves as healing, AKA helping people. And so they're already perfect. So that means you can't help them. You can only facilitate transformation. So we're letting go of this desire to heal. We're letting go of this agenda that we have, this goal, this outcome we're seeking, we're not having even any expectations that we're going to do a really good job and we're going to help them. That's got to go when you're doing alchemy, because what you're really doing is being fully present. I mean, imagine if, if you really want this person to heal, that person can't just be in their own process because they may want to be a good person and, and sort of follow what you're saying. You're saying you got to heal. And they're like, Oh, I got to heal. I got to heal. Instead of kind of being present with what is. So as you are fully present, you do your best quietly and you let go. And again, this is something that you're doing maybe already in your practice. And I said uh, today, you're going to learn a lot that you can just take into your practice without practicing alchemy, because obviously all of us are trying to get to the place of just being fully present with our clients. So again, the, the patient's not going to feel pressure from you to heal. What if they're not meant to heal right now? What if they're just needing someone to hold their hand along a very tough road right now? So this is the evolution of the practitioner in sort of, sort of seeing things a little differently. You can think of yourself as a witness instead of a helper, like a crossing guard at someone else's crossing road, crossroads. So it's being yourself. It's full eye contact. If that's not something you're comfortable with, that's something you need to begin to cultivate. It's witnessing so that the transformation can happen and being hundred percent present. So why would you do this? You have, the reason has to be for yourself, not for the others. It's about your personal evolution because you will change. You will transform. You will trans transmute as much as your clients. And so you cannot work with clients who are further along than you in the alchemical journey. If you haven't experienced stage four of alchemy, which is being like a, like a little kid, like a child again, then you can't expect them to do that. So you have to be patient in the work you're doing with people and just pick the people who are ready to receive the level that you're working at. 
So an alchemical healer, you know, healing, it's not a job. It's, it's a love, a passion. It's your spiritual path. I think a lot of practitioners who are kind of burnt out and bored come to alchemy because it reinfuses that passion. It reinfuses that love of what they're doing. And it, it makes them feel like they're on a spiritual path. But if you don't feel that way, don't bother because like your, your career is your job. It's, it's not this vocation that you love and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You might have another passion, a hobby, something that's really important for you. And that's what you should be focused on and not worry about the career, not kind of giving you the same passion. So it's about, is your vocation, your Dharma to your eyes sparkle when you're thinking of healing. And, and in particular, if you are bored with your practice now, does alchemical uh, healing make you feel that sparkle in your eyes, that 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 uh, sh- that joie de vivre, that thing that makes you want to be alive. So your job is letting go of your judgments and your distractions, so that you can stop judging yourself, stop judging others, and also stop being distracted, so that you're not going to do your work, and then anything is possible. So some other things, it it really requires your open heart, which is why you may need to do a heart pains treatment. Even if you haven't had a very traumatic life, you may have had heart pains. And so it's important for you to go through these transformations before you do that with others. So you may have resistance to opening your heart and you may fear that if you open your heart, you're going to lose your identity. For example, you may feel like someone else is going to overpower you if you really open your heart. You may feel like you'd get consumed and that's not even possible, but that's a feeling that we might have. So how do you maintain your identity with heart connections? How do you really open your heart? You know, we were just talking uh, today about this doctor that someone just visited and the doctor was cold and not very, you know, not heart connected and, and just having that experience and feeling that, what does that feel like that disconnect and you know, that's not something that an alchemical practitioner can do. There's nothing wrong with being that kind of practitioner. No, it may not be very pleasant for your, for your clients, but maybe you love being a technician and you're going to heal them. And so you're doing your job and you love it. Nothing wrong with that. But if you want to do alchemy, you need to establish those heart connections, which means you're going to have to open your heart. If you feel like when you do that, people are draining your energy, that's just because you don't know how to be energetically similar to them from within yourself, like in a sincere way. So for, for the time being, if you open your heart and you can't handle that, that means you need to move that client on to another practitioner, or, you know, if it's out in the world, you just walk away. Like You don't have to force yourself to do something that feels like it's draining your energy, but there are ways. And, you know, with my apprentices, I'm always teaching them how not to be drained energetically, especially with alchemy, because you have to be so open. So it's really important. So we also say you have to have a good relationship with yourself in order to have a good relationship with anyone else. So that's really important to, to understand what we're trying to build here. You may have self-judgment. You may even have self-hatred and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, except it's painful. And, you know, that's where the ghost points come in. And you also need to be patient because honestly, you're the patient, (laughs) even though you think you're the practitioner. And so you have to be patient with you moving along your own alchemical path. And again, you can't work with someone who's further along than you are. So, so much of this work, as we're talking about an open heart is, is about this concept of the void, the void between heaven and earth. So the, the thing that we teach first and foremost is to how to get into the void and what that means. And so what that means is that first you imagine your heart has an empty space inside of it where the blood flows through. And that is the void of your heart. So you can put your awareness into the void of your heart. And then from there, you're going to enter your patient's heart. That's the heart connection that we're talking about. Now, very advanced, once you are becoming more of an advanced practitioner, then you can enter that greater void between heaven and earth, 
where you may be able to do work with, for example, another entity like a GUI. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later, but that's what I mean by entering the void. So in the void of the patient's heart, you're going to experience what they're experiencing. You're like one heart because you're in your void of your heart. Now you're sharing their void of their heart. There is no physicality in the void. So you're experiencing what they experience. So the number one indicator of success of a treatment is that you've transformed as much as they've transformed. So you go through these huge realizations together very sincerely. So it's like your one heart. So this is my favorite quote, Claude Lahr and Elizabeth Rochard de la Vallée. You must first have a deep understanding of your own life before prevent, pretending to know life in another, especially the disturbances and the development of life in another. So what that means is, again, you have to have that good relationship with yourself in order to have a good relationship with others. You need to have a deep understanding of your own life. That's the five elements, the nine palaces, everything we said. But also you need to understand that when I was trying to tell you about the aura and the grayness that I see, or how do you, how do you understand disturbances in another? And we already know this innately, but we're going to try to really make that much more clinical for you today. And, and also I have other workshops that you can take if you, if that's an area you want to go into. So we're going to, let me just check the time. We great. We're going to be moving on and doing some work that we're going to do a meditation at some point. So um, we're going to kind of have a discussion before that, and then we're going to do the meditation. So this is all about who am I? So as you can see, before we do a lot of the clinical work, we're really challenging you to ask questions of yourself to see if you want to go down the road of alchemical you know, healing. And the first question is, who are you? Are you the hero, the saint, or the alchemist? So the hero is the person who you know, comes in uh, with shiny armor on their horse and saves the day. It's the, it's the savior. It's the person who's going to be the healer, who's going to help. And I'm sure many of us have had that path in the past and may still feel very tied to that. I have to help people. And that's the hero. The saint is more about acceptance of what is. And that is a wonderful healing of itself. If, if someone has stage four cancer and they just need to learn to live with it, how can they bring in such an acceptance of themselves in that state that they can be happy and they can evolve and do all the things that we're talking about. That's the saint's role. You can teach someone how to do that. It's very hard to live with something like stage four cancer and be happy and, and live in acceptance, you know, not resisting it, but accepting that this is where I am and I'm going to enjoy my life anyway. That would be the saint. That would be you teaching them that the alchemist is in between. So the alchemist is facilitating transformation but only when inspired. So it's not this, like, I have to be a hero, but if, if I show up and the crossroads meet and here's this person and here I am, I may facilitate the inspiration, the transformation of that person because of my inspiration, because I'm inspired to do so. And that would be the alchemist. So you may be all three, but it's really important for you to be honest about where you are today. And I'm not saying you have to be the alchemist today, but obviously if you want to do alchemy, you need to kind of look at how you could be more of an alchemist going forward. The next uh, three things is whether you're a technician, a teacher, or a shaman. These correspond to what we were just talking about. A technician is about points and protocols and you know what needs to be done. It's very exacting and specific. And it's, you know, wonderful thing. We all need to be technicians in Chinese medicine. We have so many points to learn, so many herbal formulas to learn. I mean, it's never ending. So that's the role of the technician. That's the knowledge base that we are building from. And that might be also the exactness that you feel you need to add to where is that point exactly? you know, the micromillimeter of difference between moving your needle here to there, that's you as a technician, which is great. 
But you may also think that's not as important as what you're saying to the people, what you're teaching them in terms of how you're helping them. Maybe you think, I don't just want to give person a fish. I want to teach them how to fish so they can feed themselves. That would be the concept of the teacher. And I'm sure many of us, maybe you're doing dietary therapy or other kinds of like conversations we're having with people and we're, we're teaching them. And that's also one of these sort of roles. These are, these are the practitioner roles. And the last one is, are you a shaman? Now a shaman does not care what the outcome is. The shaman doesn't have any expectations of what needs to happen or an agenda or a goal. They're simply stepping in footsteps that are already there. So that means that if they're following the spontaneity of their life and the inspiration of where they think they need to go, they show up in the treatment room, that person, again, the crossroads meet like the alchemist, they feel the inspiration because they're present and they're just being And then they can potentially, you would call it help the person, but it's more of a facilitation. So the question is, which one of these are you right now? And honestly, like, it's fine, whichever one you are, there's no like hierarchy here. There's no, you know, right way or wrong way. It's just, which one are you? And I knew from the early days that I wanted to work as a shaman. Like this was the area that I was fascinated with. And it, it's probably why I started out in shamanism. And so for me, I had to then go be the technician because really we have to be all three of these to be a healer. So it's not like we, we can just ignore the technical or ignore the teacher. But the question is, which one of these is really where you're happiest right now? And it may change. The other thing you need to understand about yourself is your, what I call your psychic powers. And so there are three categories. You can be clairvoyant, clairaudient, or clairsentient. And now I believe all of us have some of at least one or more of these. And so even though I think of it as your superpower, it's not that super if everyone has it, but let's just go with that idea because it does feel like it's a superpower um, when you're using it in the treatment room. If you're clairvoyant, you can see those colors, those shapes, those auras. If you're working in the void and you are working like, for example, with an entity like a Gui, then you can see things. You might see the story unfold. So you're very visual, visual. I'm not so visual, you know, that's not my strong suit though. I've developed it by being an alchemical healer. So I think as you become an alchemical healer, you really learn how to do all three of these pretty well. Claire audience is auditory. So when I do these treatments, I always play music and the music is integral in, in the treatments because it's vibrational. And so I needed to develop, again, I'm not very Claire audience. I needed to develop my own Claire audience because I can now hear the music and what the person's saying at exactly the same time, so much so that I can hear when the person is saying the exact same words that the song is saying, and then I can point it out to them and they're like blown away. And it happens a lot. So, you know, these are things that you begin to develop, but you may already be clairaudient. You may already have internal guidance. That's a voice that you're aware of. You may have chanting. You may, um, you may really be related to music and songs, and you may be able to relate that to the person that you're working with. And then there's clairsentience, which is the one that I'm strongest in by nature. And so that's about sensory experience. It's about movement. It's about energy awareness. It's feeling when a point is done. I don't need to be told when a point is done. I feel it. It's about feeling the presence of a gui if there is one and when it's gone. So these are just things that you start to develop. Like if you don't have clairsentience, you'll, you'll eventually, I mean, obviously if you're working with acupuncture, you have some clairsentience because you have been taught to feel dachi. You feel when the needle clicks in, you feel that transformation that happens with the needle. And so that's your clairsentience. So you might be stronger in one area like I was, or you may already be stronger in two or even three of these. Hallelujah. If you are fantastic. 
Um, so the question you can ask yourself is, do you see, or do you hear, or do you feel things and which one's most comfortable for you? The next thing about who am I is what are your five elements? And we like to say that you have all five elements within you. They're just in a particular order. So what is the stack up of those elements inside you? Now, I know that those of you who are five element based in Worsley, they talk about withins. It's a slightly different concept. So just put that aside because it gets very confusing. I find that I have to get my five element practitioners to let that go a little bit. Because in order to understand yourself, you're going to want to know what's the primary and then that secondary is like a flavor of your primary. And then that third one is the one where you go when everything is really bad and you don't get the good parts of the element. You get the really crappy parts. Like if you're wood third, then you're blaming everyone. Or if you're earth third, you're whiny and just, you know, feeling like nobody's helping you. Or if you're fire third, you, you're, you're like, nobody loves me. So these are all things that we need to understand because these come out in our patient's stories and we need to understand what they mean so we can help them put a framework around it for themselves. So you need to determine the order of your elements, especially really the first three. So alchemy requires understanding your true nature and the true nature of your client. So then you can also understand why you may have difficulty interacting with that particular client and how you can make it better how you can actually like shuffle your deck, your stack up. So if you're fire first, maybe this client, I need to be metal. So instead of being so communicative and getting them to talk, I can recede a little bit and relax and just be with the person. That would be an example of how I can shift my stack up. I can be all five elements. So you become also adept at elemental stack up diagnosis in your clients when you're doing alchemy. And again, you know, the five element program, sometimes it can get confusing for the, the purpose of alchemy, what we're trying to do. Sometimes I need to work with five element people. They know tons and tons, but they still aren't able to apply it in an alchemical way. And then your nine palaces. So this is more of a theoretical understanding of what's happening with the person. What is their relationship to the nine palaces? So I'm asking, who are you? What is your relationship to your nine palaces? Where are your challenges? Where are your struggles? And where are any heart pains if you have any? And I always say, you know, if you're older than 20 and you've been on this planet for a while, I, I find it hard to believe you don't have any heart pains. So you know, pretty much all of us have some. And so that's why I really say all of my apprentices, I, I ask them to do the heart pains treatment to receive it because we all have some, so we need to clear them. And just finally, before we do our meditation, um, mysticism in general, um, just to talk about it, this is mystical work. So it's unlike religion. So, you know, even though we say it's Taoist, you know, Taoist is really like a philosophy and a religion, both, but we're really talking about the mystical aspects of Taoism in particular, because that's heavily influencing alchemy. So we're talking about self-discovery. We're talking about, you know, no longer being interested in just what the world's saying it offers you. It's, it's like, you know, why would you be interested in the newest technology or the newest science, you know? you know, most of us in, in the, in the world, we're looking for new gadgets, better ways of being. We have kind of a modern obsession with the growth that we felt by just having the internet in our lives. And the fact that I can zoom with you today and, and do this lecture. I mean, this is huge, right? And so we're obsessed with that, but what if we receive from that? We're no longer interested in that. And what if we're trying to modernize ourselves? What is your technology? for modernizing yourself. So this is inner alchemy. This is not trying to find a new elixir or a new gadget or a new, you know, technology. It's like, what about our technology that we're going to apply within that's alchemy for me, that's alchemy that this is technology that I'm applying to myself. So that's a way to think of it. Okay. All right. So, um, in we're going to do about a 20 minute meditation. 
And so for today, I, if you have a journal or some paper nearby and a pen, I would recommend that you could always uh, type on your computer. But what we're going to do is do this Who Am I meditation. And then you're going to have a little bit of time to write where we're going to take a break. And you, of course, can, you know, go get a snack, whatever you want. So we're going to do this meditation. And when we're done, we're going to take a 10 to 15 minute break and then come back. So at the end, I'll tell you how long you have before we reconvene. And so this meditation is really about getting your spirit level connected in with what you think, because if I asked you right now, what you think your mind's going to answer that question, your mind's going to answer the, who am I question? We don't want to hear from your mind. We want to hear from your higher self. We want to hear from the spirit, the Shen. So all of our meditations are really looking to do that because alchemy is about the Shen. That's the gold. That's the perfection. So we're going to be asking you to, you know, um, get ready now for this. And then I'm going to go ahead and do the meditation. All right. So everyone, you can um, get settled in. You can sit in a chair. If you're already in a chair, that's just fine. You your feet on the floor and your hands can be placed on top of your thighs. You can rest your palms upward in that case. Or if you would like to sit cross-legged on the floor, you can put your hands one inside the other, like you're creating a bowl a bowl. And if you're um, female or more yin dominant, you would put your right hand inside your left hand. And if you're male or more yang dominant, you would put your left hand inside of your right hand. And you would do that. You would let that settle right in your lap. So it's easier if you're cross-legged to do the bowl idea. And I like to say it's as if you're accepting the gifts of the universe. So that's the, the place that we're going to, to start. So you can go ahead and get ready and I'll begin. Okay. So we're going to start by um, just sitting comfortably in the chair and closing your eyes and take a slow breath in and a slow breath out. And as you breathe in again, I want you to focus on the top of your head and on your exhale, imagine that energy or water is slowly and gently flowing down from the top of your head, over your eyes, down your face. Or you can imagine liquid like an egg yolk or honey, warm and soft, slowly moving down from the top of your head and over your eyes and down the front of your face. Just feel that downward energy descending over your eyes and your face. Breathe in again and continue to focus around your eyes allowing any tight area, some tension to relax as you exhale. Ask yourself, how does this area around your eyes feel? Does it feel like it's relaxing or do you feel an area of tightness? As you breathe in again, with your exhale, you can imagine this liquid or energy slowly moving down through your cheekbones and relaxing into your jaw, allowing that energy to sink and relax down and just let all your facial muscle, muscles go. So breathe in again and breathe out. Breathe in again. And as you breathe out, feel any pressure present in your jaw release. 
And if you're clenching your teeth in any way, let them go. As you're focusing on releasing tension in the jaw area, breathe in and notice if there are any other areas in your body, especially in your legs, that might be tensing up as you try to relax your jaw. Sometimes when you relax above, you tense up below. So if you feel any tension, especially in the legs, when you breathe out, relax the legs that are the areas that are tensing up and allow the area in your jaw and face to relax. Breathe in again. Now focus on the top of the back of your head. And as you breathe out, Imagine the energy slowly flowing down the back of your head into the nape of your neck and across the tops of your shoulders. Being mindful that your lower body is staying relaxed as well. Breathe in again, and as you breathe out, imagine the energy descending down the front of your throat, into the base of your throat, and into your chest. Now breathe in again, and let the energy from the ridge of your shoulders Travel down your back, along the sides of your ribs, like a gentle waterfall, falling all the way down to your hips. As the energy reaches your hips, imagine it's anchoring you into your chair or the floor. Breathe in again, and from your hips, as you exhale, allow the energy to travel down the back of your legs, all the way into the soles of your feet, and into the ground. Feel the soles of your feet getting heavier, as if they're connected to the ground, or if you're sitting cross-legged, Imagine your ankles and feet melting into the ground. Breathe in again and breathe out. Now take some time to scan for any tension or tightness in your entire body, your head, your torso, and your limbs. Do you feel any resistance in those areas? If so, focus on that tight area and ask yourself, what is causing this resistance? Breathe in again, and now let this resistance flow down into the ground with your exhale. Now direct your attention to your heart. Just be present with your own heart.
If your mind is chattering to you, just relax your mind like you're wiping a whiteboard and let it go. And come back to your heart. Just be present with your own spirit. Now ask yourself the question, who am I? Who am I? Now quietly repeat this question in your own mind several times. Who am I? Now using your visual skills, your clairvoyance, see if you can see a symbol of who you are. It can be anything. You can think of it as an insignia, something that represents you. Like in the old days when people signed letters with wax and a seal or a stamp, what is your insignia? that's uniquely yours, that identifies you. What's your symbol, your seal? If you're more clairvoyant, you might find this very easy. And if not, that's fine. You can then move on and use your auditory skills to hear who you are. Ask yourself, who am I? And listen. Is there a note that's uniquely yours? Only your note, your heart's note. If someone else heard this note, they would say, that's your note. Because it identifies you. Maybe it's a type of music or a string of notes. It's your heart's note. Every heart has a unique note and it attempts to find resonance with everything else in the world. What is your note? If you're more clairaudient, this may be quite easy for you. Just take a moment and connect with that sound. Now let's move on and use your clairsentient skills and you can feel inside yourself for your energy. What is your energetic signature? Who are you? This is the energy that if someone who was, clair who was next to you, sitting next to you, and they were clairsentient, even in the dark, they would sense that you were sitting there. They could feel your vibrational nature. This energy identifies you. What is your vibrational energy? Mm -hmm. 
Now take a moment and go back and think about the three things we just did and which one is strongest for you. Was it the visual stamp or seal, the insignia? Was it the auditory note that's yours and yours alone? Or was it vibrational, a feeling of energy? Pick one of those three and take a few minutes and really focus on that one thing, the true you. As you meet this true you, imagine how this self can be more authentic in the world. You can still take your time, but when you're done, you can open your eyes and come back to the present moment. And I ask that if you would like to write this down in your journal, please do so. And I invite you and encourage you to share in the chat box what your experience is. And I will share some of those experiences with you all and comment on them. So usually I like to do this as a very interactive process. So please, I invite you to go ahead and share your experience with us. We're going to take a 15 minute break. So we will come back at 10.45 Pacific time or 1.45 Eastern if you're on my coast. And um, we'll share our experiences at that point. But if you would like, you can continue to meditate during this time. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Recording stopped.